Hi, here in this question we have a certain race is made up of three stretches A, B and C. Each is two kilometers long and uh, is to be covered by a certain mode of transport. These are the three modes of transport. The following table gives these modes of transport for the stretches and the minimum and maximum possible speeds over these stretches. For example, stretch has A has to be covered by a car. The minimum speed the car can travel is 40 and the maximum it can travel is 60. And the same is given for stretch B and C as well. The speed over a particular stretch is assumed to be constant. The previous record for the race is 10 meters. Okay. So if let's say a car travels uh, in stretch A, it will travel a at a constant speed between 40 and 60. Similarly, motorcycle will travel at a constant speed between 30 and 50 and so on. And the previous record for the race is 10 minutes. That is the least time taken to cover the race so far is 10 minutes. Let's look at the questions. The first question here is, Anshuman travels this minimum uh, at minimum speed uh, by car over A. Okay, so let's talk about stretch A, B and C. Stretch A is 2 kilometers. B as well is 2 kilometers and the stretch C is also 2 kilometers. Now it's given that Anshuman travels at minimum speed by car over A. So the min minimum speed of car is 40. So Anshuman travels at 40 kilometers per hour. And complete stretch B at the fastest, fastest speed. Fastest speed in stretch B will be 50 kilometers per hour. Now, the question is at what speed should he cover stretch C in order to break the previous record? So, let's say stretch C is covered as at S kilometers per hour so that the previous record is broken. The previous record is 10 minutes. So, the total time taken by Anshuman for all these three stretches should be less than 10 minutes. Now, this is 10 minutes, right? So, let's convert it into hours. So, 10 by 60 hours. Now, this 10 by 60 hours should be greater than the sum of all these three times correct time taken at uh, in stretch a by anshuman will be distance upon speed 2 by 40 time taken for stretch b will be 2 by 50 and time taken for stretch c will be 2 by s this is the total time taken by anshuman and this should be less than 10 by 60 this should be less than the previous record right so let's see uh, 2 by 20 is 1 by 20 plus 1 2 by 50 is 1 by 25 plus 2 by s is equal to 1 or oh, sorry less than 1 by 6 okay 1 by 20 plus 1 by 25 the LCM here will be 100 this will be 5 plus 4 and uh, plus 2 by s should be less than 1 by 6 okay so we have 2 by s should be less than 1 by 6 minus this thing goes here becomes minus 9 by 100 okay so 2 by s should be less than the lcm here will be 300 so this will be 300 by 6 is 50 minus 27 now 50 minus 27 is 23 so what we have is 2 by s should be less than 23 by 300 and cross multiplying this effectively gives us 600 should be less than 23 by s or rather s should be greater than 600 by 23 now since s should be greater than 600 by 23 600 by 23 will be definitely greater than 20 but the maximum speed for uh, stretch c is 20 but here the speed for stretch c comes out to be more than 20 so is it possible that s can be greater than 20 no it is not possible s has to be less than equal to 20 so the correct answer for this question is option c this is not possible now coming to the next question we have uh, mr hare completes the first stretch at a minimum speed so the first stretch minimum speed is 40 so the first stretch a is covered at 40 kilometers per hour okay and uh, and takes the same time for stretch B. Cool. So what happens is in stretch A, the time taken will be 2 by 40. This will be the time taken for stretch A. Now for stretch B, the time taken is same. That means stretch B is also traveled at a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. 
right and that is possible because speed has to be between 30 and 50 so 40 is also possible plus the time taken for stretch c is such that uh, what happens is he takes 50 percent more than the previous record to complete the race so the total time taken is 50 percent more than the previous record which is 10 minutes so 50 percent more than 10 minutes is uh, 15 minutes so the total time taken is 15 minutes here and since all of this is in hours let's convert this into hours so 15 by 60 hours this is the total time taken that will be equal to 2 by 40 for the first stretch 2 by 40 for the second stretch plus 2 by let's say s is the speed in the third stretch right so this is the total time taken so this is uh, 2 by 40 plus 2 by 40 is 4 by 40 4 by 40 is effectively 1 by 10 plus 2 upon s is uh, 15 by 60 is 1 by 4 so we have 2 by s is equal to 1 by 4 minus 1 by 10 the LCM here is 20 this becomes 5 minus 2 which is 3 by 20 so 2 upon s is 3 by 20 so from here we have 2 into 20 40 is equal to 3 into s 3s so s comes out to be 40 by 3 now 40 by 3 is 13.33 so the speed for the third stretch is 13.33 kilometers per hour and this is what we wanted right mr has speed for stretch c which is option b 13.33 kilometers per hour now coming to the last question in this set in this last uh, question we have mr tortoise completes the race at an average speed of 20 kilometers per hour okay so this whole thing is covered at an average speed of 20 kilometers per hour his average speed for the first two stretches okay sorry the whole average is 20 the average speed for the whole journey is 20 such that the average speed for the first two stretches is four times that of the last stretch so for the last stretch if let's say the average speed is s that means the average speed for the first two stretches is four times of s this is what is given so let's see the total time taken will be six kilometers at an average speed of 20 six by 20 this is going to be the total time taken this should be equal to time taken for the first two parts plus the time taken for the third part the first two parts are 4 kilometers traveled at an average speed of 4s this is the time taken for the first two parts plus the time taken for the last part will be 2 by s okay so we have 4 4 gets cancelled out we have 1 upon s plus 2 upon s is 3 upon s right cross multiplying we have 6 into s is equal to 20 into 3 which is 60 so s comes out to be 60 by 6 which is 10 so speed for the third part is 10 kilometers per hour and that is possible because s has to be can be between 10 and 20 so that is fine perfectly fine if s is between 10 and uh, 20 or rather if s is 10 4s comes out to be 40 now can the average speed be 40 here yes even if we assume that the speed for the first part is 40 and for the second part is 40 that is possible 40 lies in both these ranges right so s can be 40 so we have to figure out find the speed over stretch c the answer is option c option c here is the correct answer thank you hi here in this question we have uh, there are 60 students in a class these students are divided into three groups a b and c of 15 20 and 25 students each uh, the groups a and c are combined to form group d okay so we have three groups a b and c a b, c and b i'm writing c because we have to combine a and c so group a has 15 students group b has uh, 20 students and group c has 25 students now a and c are combined to form group d so the number of students in group d will be 40 so you effectively now you have two groups group d and group b of 40 and 20 students and we have a total of 60 students 
Now let us look at the questions. First question in the set is, what is the average weight of students in group D? Now we know the number of students in each of these groups A, B, C and D, but there is nothing which is mentioned about the average of each of these groups. So since nothing is mentioned about average of each of these groups, now let us look at the options. First option, the question is what is the average of group D? Is it going to be more than average weight of group A? Now since nothing is mentioned, how can we know about it? So we cannot say anything about it. So we cannot be sure about option A. Option B, more than average of weight of C. Again, since nothing is mentioned about average weight of A, B, C, nothing can be said for option B as well. Let's look at option C. Less than the average weight of C, even this is, not, I mean, this is something that we cannot uh, be sure of. So we cannot be sure of A, B and C. Hence, the answer here is option D cannot be determined. Okay. Now, let's look at the next question here. If one student from A is shifted to B, so one from A is shifted to B, right? So in this case, the number of students in group A, Yafir, you would say group D will reduce by one and the number of students in group B will increase by one. Now let us look at then which of the following will be true. Let's see option A, the average weight of both the groups increases. Now how do we know the average weight of A and B, which average will increase or which average will decrease, we cannot be sure because nothing is mentioned about the average of each of these groups. Nothing is mentioned, right? So option A, we cannot be sure of. Option B, the average weight of both the groups decreases. Now again, obviously this is not going to be true. The average weight of one will definitely increase and the other will definitely decrease. That's for sure going to happen. Or what may happen is that the average of both the groups remains same. That's also a possibility. But it is not possible that the average of both increases or average of both decreases. That is for sure not possible. So option B is definitely not true. Let's look at option C. The average weight of the class remains the same. Now this is definitely true. There are total 60 students in the class. They are divided into different groups. That's a different matter. But there are 60 students in, a gra in the class. Even if one student goes from one group to the other group, he, the student still remains in the class. Hence, the average weight of the class will remain same. So the correct answer here will be option C. Average weight of the class remains the same. This is not going to change. Right? Now let us look at the last question in this set. If all the students of the class have the same weight, then which of the following is false? So, we know the average weight of all the students is same. So, there are 60 students and the weight of each student is let's say x kg. Since av the weight of all the students is same, that means the average weight of group A will be same x group C will also be X, group B will also be X and for group D will also be X because the weight of each of the students is same hence the average will be same as the average average will be same as the weight of each of these students. Now let us look at the options. First option, the average weight of all the four groups is same. This is correct, right? What we need to figure out is which of the following is false. So this is correct, this is not false. Next, the total weight of A and C is twice that of total weight of B. Let's see, the total weight of B is going to be 20 is the number of students and there are uh, the weight of each student is X. So 20 into X. So for B, the total is going to be 20 X. Now for A and C together, the total weight of the students is going to be there are total 40 students in A and C combined and the weight of each of these students is X. So total weight will be 40 into X. So the total weight of A and C is twice that of total weight of B. This is correct. Hence, this is correct. This is correct here. So this also cannot be the answer. Next, the average weight of D is greater than the average weight of A. This is obviously false. This goes exactly against A, which was true. So the correct answer here is option 
सी वी नो सिंस द वेट ऑफ ईच स्टूडेंट इज सेम द एवरेज वेट ऑफ ईच ग्रुप विल आल्सो बी सेम सो डी हैज टू बी सेम एज ए एंड नॉट ग्रेटर देन ए एंड इवन इफ यू वांट टू चेक ऑप्शन डी ऑप्शन डी सेज द एवरेज वेट ऑफ All the groups remain same, even if a number of students are shifted from one group to the other, which is correct because the weight of each student is same. So even if someone leaves the group or joins the group, the average weight is not going to change, right? So this is also correct. So the only wrong option here is option C, which is the correct answer. Thank you. hi here in this question we have a student gets an aggregate of 60% marks in the five subjects in the ratio 10 is to 9 is to 8 is to 7 is to 6 if the passing marks are 50% of the maximum marks and each subject has same maximum marks then in how many subjects did he pass the exam okay so we have five subjects s1 s2 s3 s4 and s5 the maximum marks and the obtained marks let's look at that it's given that the maximum marks is same in all these subjects right so let's say the maximum marks is 100 for each of these five subjects hence the total of these maximum marks will be 500 now the student got marks in the ratio of 10 9 8 7 6 so let's say he got 10x in the first subject 9x in the second 8x in the third 7x in the fourth and 6x in the last fifth exam so the total marks that he gets will be some of these marks 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 which is 40 into x right now it's given that on an aggregate he got 60% in the all five subjects combined so the 40x marks that he obtained is effectively 60% of the total marks so we have 40x is equal to 60% of total marks 500 right so we have double zero 100 cancels out we have zero and zero gets cancelled out here so we have 4x is equal to 6 into 5 which is 30 so from here x comes out to be 30 by 4 which is 7.5 okay fine now the question is in how many subjects did he pa uh, did he pass given that the passing marks is 50% So, if passing marks is fifty percent and the maximum marks of each subject is hundred, that means to pass in any subject, he needs to get at least fifty marks. Fifty percent of hundred is fifty. So, let's see in how many subjects does he get fifty marks at least. So, in the last subject, this he gets the least marks, right? So, the marks that he gets is six into x, which is seven point five. So, this is six into seven is forty two plus six into point five is three. So, this is forty five. In the fourth subject, he gets seven into x, which is seven point five. Now seven into seven point five is forty nine plus three point five, fifty two point five. That means he gets more than fifty marks. That means he passes in S four. In fourth subject, he is he is going to pass, right? So now, if seven x itself is greater than fifty marks, eight x, nine x, and ten x are definitely going to be greater than fifty marks. Hence, he will definitely pass in S three, S two, and S one as well. so he passes in a total of four subjects so the correct answer here is option c thank you hi here in this question we have in how many ways can eight directors the vice chair men and the chairman so we have 8 plus 1 plus 1 total 10 people of a firm be seated at a round table if the chairman has to sit between vice chairman and a director okay so there are two ways of solving this question let's look at each of these ways so what we have is there are eight people to be seated or sorry 10 people to be seated around a uh, circle such that the vice chairman is always or rather the chairman is between vice chairman and a director so if the chairman has to be between vice chairman and a director 
we can also think of it in this way that the chairman has to be definitely next to the vice chairman the person or rather if let's think of it in this way wherever chairman sits there are going to be two people next to him one of there are going to be two people next to the chairman it's a circle right so there will definitely be two people next to the chairman if there are two people next to the chairman one of them has to be a vice chairman and the other has to be a director if one of them is a vice chairman the other will automatically be a director there is no other possibility right if one person next to the chairman is vice chairman the other has to be a director only so what we can do is we can make a group of chairman and a vice chairman let's make a group of chairman and a vice chairman and then you have eight directors right so effectively what you have is eight plus one total nine entities or nine people to be seated around a circle so number of ways of seating these nine people around a circle is eight factorial now what will happen in this eight factorial ways is wherever chairman is there is going to be a vice chairman next to it and the other person next to the chairman definitely will be a director there would be no other case right so eight factorial ways you can set eight directors and this group of chairman and vice chairman now in how many ways can you form this group of chairman and vice chairman it is two factorial so the total number of ways is eight factorial into two factorial is two so this is going to be the answer option b this is one way of doing this question the other way of doing this question is let's forget about the chairman for the time being let's consider the eight directors plus the vice chairman okay so we have a total of nine people here these nine people can be seated around a circle in eight factorial ways right 1,2,3,4,5,6,7,8,9 these nine people are seated around a circle in 8 factorial ways so let's say this is the vice chairman and all the other are directors correct now what about the chairman where can you seat the chairman the chairman has to be next to the vice chairman and a director so the chairman can be either at this position or at this position in between vice chairman and and the director so there are two places for the chairman so the total number of ways will be 8 factorial into 2 which again gives you the answer as option b so the total number of ways of seating these 10 people with the given conditions is 8 factorial into 2 thank you hi here we have log of this whole thing base 2 is equal to 1 then what could be the value of x now this is a very straightforward sort of question where we will be using the property of logs so we have log of something base 2 is 1 so let's convert this into uh, the exponential equation so if we we know that log of a base b if it is let's say x then converting it into exponential equation will have the number a will be equal to base b to the power x correct we have this so converting this into exponential equation this is the number this is the base and this is the power so we'll have number which is log of 7 x square minus x plus 37 is equal to base 2 to the power 1 2 to the power 1 is 2 okay now again we have log of something base 7 is equal to 2 so the number this is the base and this is the power so again we can convert this into exponential equation so we'll have the number x square minus x plus 37 is equal to base 7 to the power 2 7 square is 49 taking 49 on the left hand side we have x square minus x 37 minus 49 is minus 12 which is 0 right now we can further split the middle term as minus 4x plus 3x minus 12 is 0 so the two terms when we split are minus 4 and plus 3 minus 4 plus 3 is minus 1 and minus 4 into plus 3 is minus 12 right so taking x common here 
we have x minus 4 remaining and taking plus 3 common here, we have x minus 4 remaining which is equal to 0. Taking x minus 4 common from both the sides and we have x plus 3 here, this is equal to 0. So from here we have either x is equal to 4 or x is equal to minus 3, right? So the uh, correct answer here will be x is 4 or minus 3, option C. Only x equals to 4 is there in the options. So option C here is the right answer. Thank you. Hi, in this question we are given after allowing a discount of 11.11%, 11.11 we know is 1 ninth in terms of fraction, a trader still makes a gain of 14.28%. Now 14.28 is 1 seventh in terms of fraction. At how many percent above the cost price does he mark his goods? So the whole process is basically the shopkeeper must have bought an item at certain cost price. He marks it up and labels the price at mark price and then he gives a discount and finally sells the goods. It's given that the discount here is 11.11% and even after this discount he ultimately earns a profit of 14.28%. So what is the markup percentage or what percentage must he have marked up? That's the question. Now the best way to solve this question would be through multiplication factor. We know multiplication factor overall is equal to the multiplication factor for marking up into the multiplication factor for discount. Correct? Now the overall multiplication factor will be 1 plus P by 100 which is 1 by 7. So 1 plus 1 by 7 is the overall multiplication factor which is equal to the multiplication factor for markup into multiplication factor for discount will be 1 minus 1 ninth. Okay? So we have 1 plus 1 by 7 is 8 by 7 into multiplication uh, this is equal to multiplication factor for markup into 1 minus 1 by 9 is 8 by 9. So 8, 8 gets cancelled out. We have multiplication factor for markup is 9 by 7. This is the multiplication factor for markup. Hence the percentage markup is going to be the multiplication factor 9 by 7 minus 1 into 100%. So 9 minus 7 is 2 by 7 into 100%. Now we know 1 by 7 is 14.28%. So 2 by 7 will be twice of this which is 28.56%. Hence the markup uh, on the goods was option A 28.56%. Thank you. Hi, in this question we have if n is an integer, how many values of n will give an integral value of this expression? Now remember we are talking about only integral values, they can be either positive or negative, right? So we have the expression 16n square plus 7n plus 6 whole divided by n. This has to be an integer. So let's do one thing. Let's divide each of these terms by n. So this whole thing by n is effectively 16n square by n plus 7 into n by n plus 6 by n. Now 16n square by n is effectively 16n plus 7n by n is 7 plus 6 by n. This whole thing has to be an integer. Now we know 16 into n is already an integer. If n is an integer, this is already an integer. Similarly, 7 is definitely an integer. So for this whole expression to be an integer, 6 upon n has to be an integer. It can be a positive or a negative, any sort of integer, but it has to be an integer. So now if 6 upon n has to be an integer, it means that n should perfectly divide 6. 
whether n is positive or negative irrespective of its sign n should perfectly divide 6 so basically it means n should be a factor of 6 right so what are the positive factors of 6 or the natural number factors of 6 6 is divisible by 1 2 3 and 6 so the positive values n can take is 1 2 3 and 6 so since n can also take negative values the negative values it can take is are minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and minus 6 so even if n is minus 1 6 upon minus 1 will be minus 6 which is an integer 6 upon minus 2 will be minus 3 again an integer so n can take all these values 4 positive and 4 negative so a total of 8 possible values n can take right so the question was how many values of n will give an integral value of n so the correct answer here will be 8 which is not there in any of the options hence option d will be the right answer here thank you hi yeah we have a dealer buys dry fruits at uh, 100 rupee per kg 80 rupees per kg and 60 rupees per kg now he then mixes them in the ratio of 3 is to 4 is to 5 by weight and sells the whole mixture at a profit of 50 percent at what price per kilogram does he sell the dry fruits the ratio in which they are mixed is 3 is to 4 is to 5 so let's say 3 kg of the first variety 4 kgs of the second variety and 5 kgs of the third variety are mixed so we have a total of 3 plus 4 7 7 plus 5 12 kgs and we have to figure out at what price was it sold such that 50 percent profit is earned so we know the total selling price will be 1.5 times the total cost price correct why because of 50 percent profit uh, the total selling price should be 50% more than the total cost price hence a multiplication factor of 1.5 now let's say the selling price per gram is x so the total selling price is going to be 12 into x for 12 kgs this is going to be 1.5 into the total cost price of the mixture now this 3 kg is bought at 100 rupees so the cost price of this 3 kgs will be 300 rupees similarly cost price of this 4 kg will be 4 into 80 320 rupees and the cost price of this 5 kg will be 5 into 60 which is 300 rupees so we have 300 plus 300 plus 300 is 900 plus 20 920 1.5 into 920 is 12 into x hence x comes out to be 1.5 into 920 divided by uh, 12 okay so this 10 gets multiplied here this becomes 15 into 92 by 12 now let's try to solve this this goes by 3 5 times this goes by 3 4 times 92 goes by 4 23 times so finally we have 5 into 23 is 115 rupees per kg the value of x comes out to be 115 rupees per kg so the selling price of the whole mixture was 115 per kg which is not there in these or three options the, so the correct answer must be option d none of these thank you hi here we have fresh grapes contain 90 percent water while dry grapes contain 20 percent water so we have fresh grapes and dry grapes so what happens from fresh grapes to dry grapes is that water gets evaporated and the pulp remains the same so for example if you talk, uh, fresh grapes are basically the angur jo hote hai, and dry grapes is the kishmish so how do you get uh, uh, Kishmish from fresh grapes is the water evaporates but the actual pulp of the grape remains constant correct so let's talk about the water weight and the pulp weight okay initially uh, what we have is the weight of dry grapes obtained from 20 kg of fresh grapes so we have 20 kgs of fresh grapes and we need to figure out what amount of dry grapes is we are going to get so let's say we are going to get x kgs of dry grapes from 20 kgs of fresh grapes 
Now initially fresh grapes contain 90% water. So 90% of 20 kgs is 18 kgs is going to be the water in this 20 kg and 2 kg is going to be pulp. Now water is going to get evaporated. So final quantity of water is going to be less than 18 kgs. But the amount of pulp has to remain the same. The pulp will not get evaporated. So pulp should remain the same 2 kgs. Now what happens in dry grapes is, dry grapes contain 20% water. So whatever this quantity is, it's going to be 20% of x kg. So if this is 20% of x kg, the amount of pulp should be 80% of x kgs, right? So here we can form the equation that 2 kgs is 80% of x kg, right? So this 80 by 100 is effectively 4 by 5 and uh, x comes out to be 2 into 5, 10 by 4. 10 by 4 is 2.5. So the value of x is 2.5 kgs. Hence the correct answer here is option B, 2.5. Thank you. Hi, here we have an express train traveling at 80 km per hour overtakes a goods train twice as long going at 40 km per hour. So there is an express train and there is a goods train whose length is twice the length of express train. So let's say express train is L meters, the length is L meters and it is going at 80 km per hour. The length of the goods train is twice of L meters and it is going at 40 kilometers per hour okay it's given that the time taken for this train to overtake this train is 54 seconds okay so we have 54 is equal to now the time taken will be the sum of the two lengths so sum of the two lengths is 3l divided by the relative speed now the relative speed is 80 minus 40 since they are going in same direction it's given that they overtakes right so overtake means they are going in the same direction. So relative speed is 40 km per hour. But since L is in meters and time is in seconds, let's convert this speed into meters per second by multiplying it with 5 by 18. So we have 54 is equal to 18 gets multiplied here. 3 into 18 is 54 L divided by 40 into 5 is 200. So 54 cancels out with 54 one times. 1 into 200 is 200 meters. Length of the track is 200 meters here. Okay. Now let's come to the final question. How long will the express train, this express train, which is of 200 meters traveling at 40 kilometers per hour, how long will it take to cross a platform, to cross a platform of 400 meters? Now the required time will be sum of the length of the train and the platform which is 600 meters divided by just the speed of the express train. Platform is stationary, right? So speed of the express train is 40 kilometers per hour. But since we have to give answer in seconds and the distance is given in meters, so again we will have to convert this into meters per second by multiplying it with 5 by 18, okay? So 5 into 40 is 200, 600 by 200 is effectively 3 and we have uh, 3 times of 18 sorry sorry I made a mistake here the speed of the express train is 80 so this must be 80 actually this should be 80 right so we have uh, 600 into 18 divided by 18 to 5 which is 400 so now let's simplify this factor of 100 gets cancelled out this goes by 2 3 times this goes by 2 2 times 18 goes by 2 9 times so we have 3 into 9 is 27 seconds so the final answer here is option c 27 seconds hi here we have a student instead of finding the value of 7 8th of a number found the value of 7 18th of the number. If his answer differed from the actual 1 by 770 find the number. So the, let's say the initial number is x. 
सो ही वॉन्टेड टू फाइंड सेवन एट्थ ऑफ एक्स बट ही फाउंड सेवन एटीन ऑफ एक्स सो ऑब्वियसली दिस वैल्यू इज गोइंग टू बी लेस देन दी वैल्यू विच ही ओरिजिनली वॉन्टेड टू फाइंड सो दिस माइनस दिस द डिफरेंस ऑफ दीज टू वैल्यूज इज सेवन सेवेंटी एज पर द क्वेश्चन सो वी हैव सेवन एक्स बाई एट माइनस सेवन एक्स बाई एटीन एज सेवन सेवेंटी सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी सी दर इज अ कॉमन फैक्टर ऑफ सेवन इन ऑल दीज थ्री टर्म्स सो डिवाइडिंग द होल इक्वेशन बाई सेवन वी हैव सेवन कैंसल्स आउट एक्स अपॉन एट माइनस सेवन कैंसल्स आउट एक्स अपॉन एटीन इज इक्वल टू सेवन सेवेंटी बाई सेवन इज हंड्रेड एंड टेन सो वी हैव एटीन एक्स माइनस एट एक्स अपॉन एट इंटू एटीन इज इक्वल टू हंड्रेड एंड टेन ओके सो फ्रॉम हियर वी हैव टेन एक्स माइनस एट एक्स इज सॉरी एटीन एक्स माइनस एट एक्स इज टेन एक्स अपॉन एट इंटू एटीन इज हंड्रेड एंड टेन सो द फैक्टर ऑफ टेन कैंसल्स आउट वी हैव एक्स इज इक्वल टू एट इंटू एटीन इंटू इलेवन सो वी हैव एट इंटू एटीन इज सिक्सटी फोर वन फोर्टी फोर ओके वन फोर्टी फोर इंटू इलेवन इज वन फोर फोर वन फोर फोर विच इज वन फाइव एट फोर सो द वैल्यू ऑफ द ओरिजिनल नंबर इज फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड एंड एटी फोर द करेक्ट आंसर इज ऑप्शन ए थैंक यू Hi. So here in this question, we have p and q are two positive uh, integers such that p into q is 64. Which of the following cannot be the value of p plus q? Now, uh, basically, uh, we, what we need to do is we need to write 64 as a product of two integers and see what can be the sum of these two integers. So 64 is 1 into 64. So in this case, the sum of the integers 65 is possible. The other way is twice of 32. So here the sum of the integers was sixty-five. Here the sum of the integers will be thirty-four. So from sixty-five, the sum of the integer drops immediately to thirty-four. So thirty-five is not reachable. Let's look at other possibilities as well. Sixty-four can be written as four into sixteen. So the sum can be twenty. Twenty is possible. The other way is eight into eight. Eight into eight, the sum is sixteen. So sixteen is also possible. The only sum which is not possible is option D, thirty-five. So the correct answer here is option D. Hi. In this question, we have the average marks of a student in in ten papers is eighty. So the total marks in these ten papers must be ten into eighty, eight hundred. Okay. Now, if the highest and the lowest scores are not considered, the average is eighty-one. So, the marks for the eight papers, excluding highest and lowest, would be eight into eighty-one. The average of these eight papers is eighty-one. So, the marks of these eight papers will be six forty-eight. Eight into eighty-one is six forty-eight. This effectively means that the Highest plus the lowest marks is the difference between these two marks, eight hundred minus six forty eight. Correct, eight hundred minus six forty eight is one fifty two. So the total ma uh, the sum of highest and the lowest marks is one fifty two, and it is given that the highest score is ninety two. So we have ninety two plus L is one fifty two. Hence L comes out to be sixty. The lowest that he marks or that he obtained in any test is option B, sixty here. Thank you. Hi. Here we have if the roots x one x two of the quadratic equation x square minus two x plus c is equal to zero. Also satisfy the equation seven x two minus four x one is forty seven. Then which one, one of the following is true? Well, it's given that the two roots are x one x two. So we already have this equation seven x two minus four x one is equal to forty seven. And we also know that in a quadratic, sum of the two roots 
which is x2 plus x1 is equal to minus b by a. So minus b here is minus 2 upon a is the coefficient of x square. So minus of minus 2 by 1 is 2. So x1 plus x2 is equal to 2. Now we need to simply solve these two equations to figure out the value of x1 and x2. So let's multiply the second equation with 4 and add both these equations. So we'll have 7x2 plus 4x2 is 11x2 minus 4x1 plus 4x1 is 0 is equal to 47 plus 4 times of 2 is 8. 47 plus 8 is 55. So 11x2 is 55. Hence x2 is 55 by 11 which is 5. Okay. Now if x2 is 5 from this equation x1 will be 2 minus 5 which is minus 3. So x1 will be minus 3. Let's see if we have any of these options. B and C do not give us the correct value of x1. So obviously option B and option C are wrong. Let's check for option A as well. Now option A says C is minus 15. So in this quadratic, if the two roots are 5 and minus 3, the product of the roots we know will be 5 into minus 3 which is minus 15. And the product of the roots is in a quadratic is the constant term which is c upon coefficient of x square which is 1. So c upon 1 is minus 15 hence the value of c is minus 15. So option A is correct. So the correct answer here is option A. Thank you. Hi, here we have the sum of the areas of two circles which touch each other externally is 153 pi. If the sum of their radii is 15, find the ratio of larger to the smaller radius. So let's say the radii are R1 and R2. So we have R1 plus R2 is 15 and the sum of the areas will be pi R1 square plus pi r2 square which is 153 pi. So pi here gets cancelled out. We have r1 square plus r2 square is equal to uh, 153. Also we have r1 plus r2 is 15. So let's do one thing. Since we have square over here, let's square both these sides. So we'll have r1 square plus r2 square plus twice of r1 into r2 is 15 square which is 225. So from here r1 plus r2 square is 153. So we have 153 plus twice of r1 into r2 is 225. So we have twice of r1 into r2 is 225 minus 153 is 47 plus 25 which is 72. So twice of r1 into r2 is 72 and this effectively gives us that r1 into r2 is 72 by 2 which is 36. So we have these two equations that the product of two numbers the two red i is 36 and sum of the two red i is 15. Now if you are good with calculations you can easily figure out that the value of r1 and r2 will be 12 and 3. Right? 12 into 3 is 36 and 12 plus 3 is 15. But if you are not able to figure that out, what we need to do is we need to solve these two by forming a quadratic equation. So how do we form a quadratic equation? We have R1 plus. Instead of R2 here, we can substitute R2 with 36 by R1, which is equal to 15. So we have R1 square. 15 into R1 taken on the left hand side is minus 15 R1 plus 36 is 0. So now effectively we have to do the same thing think of two numbers whose sum is minus 15 and the product is 36 so this will be r1 square minus 12 r1 minus 3 r1 plus 36 is 0 or you can use the formula method so from here r1 comes out to be either 12 or 3 so if r1 is 12 in that case sorry so if R1 is 12, in that case R2 must be 3 and if R1 is 3, in that case R2 must be 12, okay? So in any case, what we need to figure out is the ratio of larger to the smaller radius. So the required ratio 
In any case, either this or this, the larger radii, radius is 12 and the smaller radius is 3. So, the required ratio is 4 is to 1, which is option A here. Correct answer is option A. Thank you. Hi. So here in this question we have m and n are integers which are divisible by 5. Then which of the following is necessarily true? Okay. So if m and n both are divisible by 5, that means both of them are multiples of 5. So let's say m is equal to 5x and n is equal to 5 into y. Both are multiples of 5. Now let's check each of these options one by one and let's figure out which of these options is correct. So option A is m and n, sorry, m minus n is divisible by 5. Now what is m minus n? m is 5x and n is 5y. So this effectively is 5 times of x minus y. Now whatever this number is, it is a multiple of 5. m minus n is a multiple of 5, hence it will be divisible by 5. So option A is true. This is always true, whatever the value of x and y, this is always true. Let's look at the next option. Option B is m square minus n square is divisible by 25. So let's see, m square minus n square. Now m square will be 25x square minus n square will be 25y square. Taking 25 common, we have x square minus y square. Now m square minus n square is a multiple of 25. It is 25 into some integer. X and y are integers, right? So 25 into an integer. So this is always a multiple of 25. Hence it will always be divisible by 25. So m square minus n square is always divisible by 25. This is correct. Option B is correct. Always correct. Now let's check option C. C is m plus n is divisible by 10. Let's see. Now m is 5x, n is 5y. So this is equal to 5 times of x plus y. Now is this always divisible by 10? Not necessarily. It will only be divisible by 10 if x plus y is even. So 5 into an even number will be a multiple of 10. But what if x plus y is odd? In that case, it will not be divisible by 10. Right? If you have 5 into 3 or if you have 5 into 5, if you have 5 into 11, all these numbers are not divisible by 10. So this is not necessarily always true. This is not always true. Hence the correct answer this, to this question should be option C. We have to figure out which, is, which of these options is not necessarily true. Option C is not necessarily true. Thank you. Hi. Now this is a very standard question based on properties of indices. So we have uh, two terms here, 7 raised to the power 3 raised to power 2 and 7 raised to power 3 whole raised to the power 2. Okay. Now we know in this case if you have a number like this 7, a raised to power m raised to power n, this is equal to a raised to power m into n. This is the property. Okay. So this term here comes out to be 7 raised to power 3 into 2 which is 7 raised to the power 6 and here this power 2 is on 3 and not 7 cube the power 2 is only on 3 so this number is effectively 7 to the power 3 square actually 3 square is 9 so this is 7 to the power 9 so one of the terms is 7 to the power 9 the other term is 7 to the power 6 and obviously 7 to the power 9 will be greater than 7 to the power 6 hence the correct answer to this question is option B 7 to the power 3 to the power 2 is greater than 7 to the power 3 whole raised to the power 2. Hi. In this question we have a survey of 200 people in a community who watched at least one of the three channels BBC, CNN and DD showed that 80% of the people watched DD. So we, this is effectively a Venn diagram question. It's a three set Venn diagram. Okay. 
so we have uh, three channels b b c c n n and d d okay but it's given that 80 percent of the people washed d d so 80 percent of 200 is 160 so 160 washed d d 22 percent of 200 is 44 washed b b c and 15 percent of washed cnn 15 percent of 200 is 30 so 30 washed cnn okay now let us look at the questions what is the maximum percentage of people who can watch all the three channels okay so let me redraw this uh, diagram actually now the question is what is the maximum percentage of people who can watch all the three channels now you see the maximum number of people who can watch all the three channels should be the least of these three values right which is 30 maximum 30 people can watch all the three channels it cannot be more than 30 since only 30 people are watching CNN how can more than 30 people watch all the three channels so that's not possible right so maximum 30 people can watch all the three channels so 30 as a percentage of 200 is 30 by 200 into 100 percent so 30 by 2 is 15 percent so the correct answer here is option C, 15%. Okay. Let's look at the next question. If 5% of the people watched DD and CNN, 10% of them watched DD and BBC. So 5% watched DD and CNN. DD and CNN, these two together is 5%. And 10% uh, watched DD and BBC. DD and BBC, this, these two together is 10%. And these two together is 5% okay that's what is given so now we need to figure out what percent of people watched BBC and CNN only BBC and CNN only is this part we have to figure out how many of them watched only this part okay so for that to calculate this we will have to make some equations so let's name all these regions A, B, C, D, E, F and G. Okay. So we know A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F plus G is the total number of people which is actually 200. There are total 200 people. But if you add 44 plus 30 plus 160. So if you add 44 plus 30 plus 160 this sum comes out to be 204 234 and this will be equal to once you add all these three circles individually a b and c will get added once so that's fine a plus b plus c but d will get added twice once with bbc and once with cnn so we'll have twice of d similarly twice of e and twice of f as well E will get added twice, once with CNN, once with uh, DD and F will get added twice, one with, once with BBC and once with DD. What about G? G will get added thrice, once with BBC, once with CNN and once with DD. So thrice of G is what we'll have. So this is the first equation, this is the second equation. Okay. So let's subtract 2 and 1. So 2 minus 1, the right hand side will be 234 minus 200 is 34. Now the left hand side will be, we'll have a minus a 0, b minus c, b 0, c minus c is 0, 2d minus d is d, plus 2e minus e is e, plus 2f minus f is f, plus 3g minus g is 2g. So this is the equation that we have, d plus e plus f plus 2g is 34. Now let's come to this question. It's given that 5% of the people watch dd and cnn, 5% of 200 is effectively uh, 10. So 10 people watched DD and CNN. DD and CNN together is effectively G plus E. Right? So 1G plus 1E will give us 10. So we'll have 10 D plus F plus G plus 1E and 1G will together give us the sum as 10. This is 34. Okay? Now it's also given that 10% that means 20 people watched DD and BBC so DD and BBC is effectively F plus G so F plus G is 20 so we'll have D 
प्लस ट्वेंटी प्लस टेन इज इक्वल टू थर्टी फोर राइट सो डी प्लस थर्टी इज थर्टी फोर सो दिस गिव्स अस डी इज इक्वल टू फोर राइट डी इज इक्वल टू फोर एंड दिस इज व्हाट वी वांटेड राइट द नंबर ऑफ पीपल वाचिंग ओनली बीबीसी एंड सीएनएन इज डी व्हिच इज फोर सो द परसेंटेज ऑफ पीपल इज फोर आउट ऑफ टोटल टू हंड्रेड परसेंट सो विल हैव डबल जीरो कैंसल्स आउट फोर बाय टू इज टू परसेंट सो ऑप्शन ए हियर इज द राइट आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन ओके नाउ कमिंग टू द लास्ट क्वेश्चन हियर रेफरिंग टू द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन एज इन दिस क्वेश्चन वॉट परसेंटेज ऑफ पीपल वॉच ऑल द थ्री चैनल्स सो वी नीड टू फिगर आउट द वैल्यू ऑफ जी नाउ कैन वी फिगर आउट द वैल्यू ऑफ जी विद दिस इंफॉर्मेशन गिवेन नो वी कुड फिगर आउट ओनली द वैल्यू ऑफ डी वी कैन नॉट फिगर आउट द वैल्यू ऑफ G here hence the answer should be cannot be determined here thank you hi in this question we have a man earns x percent on the first 2000 rupees and y percent on the rest of his income if he earns 700 for an income of 4000 and 900 for his income uh From his, uh, if his income is five thousand, find x percent. Okay, so the earnings is seven hundred. When the total income is four thousand, okay, that means for the first two thousand he will earn x percent. So x percent of two thousand plus out of four thousand, first two thousand is gone. So the remaining amount is two thousand, and on this remaining amount he is going to earn y percent. Okay. so x percent is effectively x by 100 so we have 700 is this will be 20 into x and y percent is also y by 100 so double zero double zero cancels out we'll have 20y again cancel out cancelling out a factor of 10 we have 70 is equal to 2x plus 2y this is the first equation right the man also earns 900 on a total income of 5000 so again this income of 900 will be he will be earning x percent of the first 2000 and on the remaining 3000 of of the 5000 2000 is done of the remaining 3000 he is going to earn y percent so this is going to be his total earnings fine so again uh, x percent is x by 100 and y percent is y by 100 so this becomes 20x plus 30y Is equal to 900. Again, cancelling out a factor of 10, we have 90 is equal to 2x plus 3y. This is the second equation, right? Now, subtracting the first equation from the second equation, we'll have 90 minus 70 is 20, which is 2x minus 2x is 0, 3y minus 2y is y. So y comes out to be 20. If y is 20, let's substitute y 20 over here. So we have seventy is equal to two x plus two into twenty is forty. Seventy minus forty is thirty, which is two x. Hence, x here comes out to be fifteen. So the value of x is fifteen percent. Option B here is the correct answer. Thank you. Hi. Here in this question we have uh, AB is the diameter of the given circle, while points C and D lie on the circumference. So AB is the diameter, so there will be a center somewhere here. C and D lie on the circumference. Now since AB is a diameter and C is connected to A as well as B, that means this is the angle made by the diameter on the circle. and we know angle made by diameter anywhere on the circumference of the circle will be a right angle so this angle will be 90 degree okay similarly this angle will also be 90 degrees adb will be a right angle and acb will also be a right angle so we have two right triangles acb and adb okay now it is given that ab is 15 ab is given to us as 15 Also, AC is given to us as twelve. AC is twelve, and BD is nine. BD is nine. 
now we need to figure out the area of the quadrilateral a c b d this should be d a c b d so for that first let's consider triangle a c b now this is a right triangle right where a b is the hypotenuse so we know a b square should be equal to a c square plus b c square a b is 15 so 15 square is 225 which is a c square which is 12 square is 144 plus b c square so from here we have b c square is 225 minus 144 is 81 that means b c will be 9 b c square is 81 taking square root both the sides b c comes out to be 9 so b c here is 9 right what about a d now if you look at this uh, pythagorean triplet 15 9 and 12 is a pythagorean triplet so abd is also coincidentally the same pythagorean uh, triplet 15 9 and this must be 12 the uh, the hypotenuse is 15 and one of the smaller sides is 9 so the third smaller side will be 12 only so what happens is both these triangles are congruent triangles they have the same sides 15 9 and 12 so area of this whole quadrilateral abcd is going to be twice the area of triangle acb correct what about area of the triangle acb now we know in a right triangle the area is half the product of two smaller sides the two smaller sides are 12 and 9 so 12 goes by 2 six times 6 into 9 is 54 54 into 2 is 108 so the area of uh, the uh, what do you say the whole quadrilateral abcd is 100 108 cm square which is not there in any of these options so the correct answer must be option d none of these thank you hi Here in this question we have uh, PQR are three consecutive odd numbers in ascending order. If the value of three times P is three less than two times R, find the value of R. So we have P, Q, and R. These they are three consecutive odd numbers. So let's say if P is x, Q will be x plus two and R will be x plus four, right? Consecutive odd numbers differ by two. So these are the consecutive three odd numbers. X has to be odd over here. Fine. Now the question says the value of three times of p. So three times of p, which is x, is three less than. So this is three less than. Three less than what? Two times of r. So two times of r is x plus four. So three x is three less than two times of x plus four. This is what we have. So let's solve this. We have three x is equal to two x plus eight minus three. So 3x minus 2x is 8. 8 minus 3 is 5. So the value of x comes out to be 5 here. Now the question is find the value of r. Now r is x plus 4, where x is 5. So 5 plus 4 is 9. So the value of r is option C, 9 here. Thank you. hi in this question we are given three functions la x y z li x y z and ma x y z and this is how they are defined fine now based on this there are three questions and we need to figure out uh, the answer to these three questions okay so let's look at the first question here given that x is greater than y is greater than z and all of them are greater than 0 which of the following is necessarily true So the best way to do this question is by assuming some values. So we will assume two set of values. One is three, two, one, and one is let's say twenty, two, and one. Okay, and let's see for these different set of values, do these relations always hold true or not? So let's look at option A. Let's look at for three, two, and one. Option A, LA three comma two comma one is basically The minimum of x here is three and y here is two. So minimum of three plus two comma two plus one. Three plus two is five. Two plus one is three. So the minimum of these two is three. 
Now Le three comma two comma one. Let's first just calculate these values and we'll figure out the options later on. Le three comma two comma one is the maximum of three minus two comma two minus one. Three minus two is one. Two minus one is one. So maximum of one and one is one. No issues. Now what is ma? Ma x y z. Ma x y z is effectively half of li x y z and la x y z. So half of three plus one. Okay. So half of three plus one is two here. Now let's see which of these options is correct. Uh, option A. La is less than li. So la is less than e is not correct. When you have this set of values three to one, the function la is greater than le. So this is not always true. So this is definitely rejected. What about option B? Ma is less than la. Ma is two and la is three. So this may be true. This is true for this set of values. This may not be true always. So we'll figure that out later. What about option C? Ma is less than le. M A is two and L E is one, so M A is greater than L E. So this is not always true. This is this may be true for some values, but not always true. So option A and option C are eliminated based on this set of values. Now let's look at the next set of values, where we have x is twenty and y is two and z is uh, what do you say one. So if x is twenty. La twenty two and one will be twenty plus two comma two plus one, right? So the minimum of these two is three. Twenty plus two is twenty two. Two plus one is three. So minimum is three. Now Li twenty two one is the maximum of twenty minus two and two minus one. Twenty minus two is eighteen and two minus one is one. So maximum of eighteen and one is eighteen. So this is eighteen. And Ma will effectively be half of three plus eighteen. So half of three plus eighteen is half of twenty-one, which is ten point five. Fine. Now, since A and C were already rejected for this particular set of values, for this set of values, let's see if B is true or not. Here, B is M A is less than L A. So M A is ten point five, L A is three. M A is actually greater than L A. So this is also rejected. For different set of values, A, B, and C can be rejected. Hence, the correct answer to this question is none of these. None of them is necessarily true. They may be true for some set of values of x and y, but not all set of values of x and y. Hence, the correct answer here is option D. Okay. Now let's look at the next question. What is the value of this whole expression? First, let's look at LA ten five and three. So LA is the minimum of ten plus five. LA ten comma five comma three is effectively Minimum of ten plus five fifteen and five plus three eight. So minimum of fifteen and eight is eight. So now we have le eight comma five comma three. So le is x minus y. Eight minus five is three and y minus z. Five minus three is two. And le is max. So max of three comma two is three. So the value of le, this whole thing comes out to be three. So what we have is ma ten comma four comma three. Ma ten comma four comma three. This is equal to half of la ten comma four comma three plus le ten comma four comma three. Right. Now this is half of L A is basically the minimum of ten plus four fourteen four plus three seven minimum of fourteen and seven is seven plus L E is the maximum of ten minus four six four minus three one so the maximum of six and one is six so half of seven plus six thirteen by two thirteen by two six point five hence the answer to this question is option B six point five here. Fine, and now coming to the last question of the set: If x is fifteen, y is ten, and z is nine, find the value of le x comma minimum of y comma x minus z comma le nine eight maximum of x comma y comma z. Okay, so basically you need to do some calculations here. So we have le. Uh, 
Now LE needs to have three terms. The first term is x, which is 15, comma. The next term is minimum of y, comma, x minus z. So minimum of y, which is uh, 10, comma, x minus z. x is 15, z is 9. 15 minus 9 is 6. So this was the first term. This was the second term. And the third term is LE of something. Now what is LE? LE again has three uh, terms here. 9, comma, 8, comma, MA of X, Y, Z. Uh, X, Y, Z are 15, 10 and 9. 15, 10 and 9. Okay. So this is MA. So let's simplify this. So we have LE of 15, comma. The second term is minimum of 10 and 6. Minimum of 10 and 6 is 6 comma le of 9 8 and ma 15 10 and 9 okay now let's simplify this ma first of all ma 15 10 and 9 now so ma 15 10 comma 9 is effectively half of la 15 10 and 9 plus le 15 10 and 9 okay so half of now LA is the minimum of X plus Y 25 and Y plus Z 19. So minimum of 25 and 19 is 19 plus LE is the maximum of X minus Y comma Y minus Z. The maximum of these two is 5. So half of 19 plus 5. 19 plus 5 is 24. Half of 24 is 12. So MA 15, 10, 9 comes out to be 12 here. So instead of MA 15, 10 and 9, we can substitute 12. So we have LE 15, 6, LE of 9, 8 and 12. Now LE is basically the maximum of 9 minus 8 which is 1, 8 minus 12. 8 minus 12 is minus 5. So the maximum of 1 and minus 5 is 1. So LE comes out to be 15, uh, sorry, this comes out to be 15, LE of 15, 6 and 1. Now we know LE 15, 6 and 1 is effectively the maximum of 15 minus 6, 9, comma, 6 minus 1, 5. So max of 9, comma, 5 is 9 over here, right? So the answer to this question is option C, 9. Thank you. Hi, here we have uh, the adjoining figure shows a set of concentric squares. If the diagonal of the innermost square is two units and if the distance between the corresponding corners of any two, uh, two successive squares is one unit. Okay, so it's given that the diagonal of the innermost square, the innermost square is this this is the diagonal and uh, this is two units this diagonal is two units and the distance between corresponding corners and of any two successive squares is one unit okay so the distance between corners of any two successive squares is one unit so this is one unit this is also one unit this is one unit this is one unit and so on now we need to figure out the difference between areas of the 8th and the 7th squares counting from the innermost square. Okay. Now the diagonal of the first square is 2 units. What about diagonal of the second square? It will be 2 plus 1 plus 1. This 1 unit and this 1 unit will increase. So 2 plus 2 units. This will be the diagonal for the second which is 4 units. For the second square, this is the length of the diagonal. For third square, it will be 2 plus 2 plus 2, 6 units. This is going to be the length of the diagonals for the third square, right? We have 2 plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this. So 1 plus 1, 2, plus 2, plus 1, plus 1, 2. Total 6 units. Similarly, diagonal for the seventh square will be 
for the first square it is 2 into 1 for second square it is 2 into 2 for third square it is 2 into 3 so for seventh square it will be 2 into 7 14 units and for eighth square the diagonal will be 2 into 8 16 units these are going to be the length of the diagonals okay and we know if diagonal is this the length of the sides will be uh, 14 by root 2 we know in a square if the side is a the diagonal is root 2 a so side is basically diagonal divided by root 2 okay so side of the seventh square will be 14 by root 2 which is 7 into root 2 and the side for eighth square will be 16 by root 2 which is 8 into root 2 okay these are the sides so the area of the seventh square will be 7 root 2 whole square which is 49 into 2 98 square units an area of the eighth square will be 8 root 2 whole square which is 64 into 2 128 square units these are the areas of 7th and the 8th squares. So the difference in areas will be the required difference is 128 minus 98 which is 30 square units. So the difference between the areas of 7th and the 8th square is option B 30 square units. Thank you. Hi, here we have three terms A, B and C and we have to figure out which of these four options is correct. So let's start with A and let's try to simplify A first of all. A we know is 2.12345 divided by now from these two terms we can take this is effectively 2.000004 whole square plus this is actually twice of 2.000004 okay so from these two terms we can take out 2.000004 common and we'll have 2.000004 Oh, sorry 2.000004 plus 2 remaining here and the numerator will be 2.000004 so this cancels out a effectively comes out to be 1 upon this plus this which is 4.000004 and this will be approximately 1 upon 4 1 upon 4 is 0 0.25 okay so obviously option A is rejected. A is greater than 0.2 so we can reject this particular option. Next let's check for B. Now as we simplified A, B here will be 3.123453 upon. From these two we can take out 3.000003 common and we'll have 3.000003 plus 3 remaining this is thrice of 3.000003 so this gets cancelled out this comes out to be 1 upon this plus this which is 6.000003 which is approximately 1 by 6 1 by 6 is 0 0.1666 this is B and let's simplify C now just as we simplified a and b c will uh, effectively be simplified to 4.000002 divided by we can take 4.000002 common from the denominator and we'll have 4.000002 2 8 point this whole thing is twice of this whole thing right so we'll have a 2 remaining here so this gets cancelled out, we'll have 1 upon this plus this 6, 6.000002, which is approximately 1 by 6, which is again 0 0.166. This is approximate value, the actual value is this and this. Okay, now let us look at the options and see which of these options is correct. Option A is already rejected, let's look at option B. A is twice of C. 
now c is 0.166 and a is 0.25 so twice of this will be approximately 0.32 or 333 which is not a option b is also rejected a is not twice of c now out of option c and d we need to figure out which of the c and b is smallest now b is one upon this thing and c is one upon this thing the smaller number will be the one with the larger denominator and the larger denominator is for b this is larger denominator than this so b is smaller than c and b is obviously smallest smaller than a as well so b is the smallest of all the three hence option d here is the right answer thank you hi here in this question we have uh, the value of each coin varies as square of the diameter so we know value is directly proportional to square of the diameter if its thickness is constant and the value varies as the thickness is directly proportional to thickness when diameter is constant so combining these two we know value is directly proportional to d square into now if v is equal to d square into t we know v1 upon v2 value two different values will be equal to d1 square into t1 upon d2 square into t2 fine now using this relation let's look at the question further if the diameter of two coins are in the ratio of 4 is to 3 what should be the ratio of their thickness if the value of the first is four times that of second so value of first is four times the value of second that is given so we have v1 upon v2 is effectively four upon one this is equal to d1 upon d2 whole square into t1 upon t2 and we are also given that the ratio of their diameters is four is to three so four is to three whole square is effectively 16 is to nine into t1 upon t2 so from here t1 upon t2 will effectively be 4 into 9 upon 1 into 16 16 goes by 4 4 times so this comes out to be 9 is to 4 so the ratio of their thickness comes out to be 9 is to 4 option b is the right answer here thank you hi in this question we have if triangle abc so this is let's say triangle abc pq are the midpoints of ab a ab bc and sorry ab and this is q sorry this is q and this is r and that would not matter actually but still so PQR are the midpoints of sides AB, BC and CA and we are need to figure out the area of triangle PQR if area of the original triangle is 20. Now we know if you join the midpoint, this is a general property of tri any triangle. If you join midpoints of a triangle, the whole triangle is divided into four smaller triangles, one, two, three and four such that the area of all these four triangles is same that is one fourth the area of the bigger triangle so area of each of these triangles will be same and it will be one fourth of 20 so area of each of these triangles will be five square units so area of pqr will also be five square units option c is the right answer here thank you hi in this question we have in a rectangle the difference between some of the adjacent side so we have a rectangle the adjacent sides are let's say length and width is b so some of the adjacent sides l plus b so the difference of this difference between some of the sides and the diagonal 
Now the diagonal of a rectangle we know is square root of L square plus B square. Right? Using Pythagoras theorem here, right? So this is square root of L square plus B square. So the difference of these two is half the length of longer side. Half of longer side which is L. Length is the longer side in a rectangle, right? So we need to figure out what is the ratio of shorter to the longer side. So the shorter side is B. So we need to figure out the ratio of B by L. Okay. So let's simplify this first. Let's bring this term on the left side and this whole term on the right side. So L minus half of L will be L by 2 plus B is equal to square root of L square plus B square. Now squaring both the sides, the left hand side will be L square plus B square. This is the right hand side. The left hand side will be L square by 4 plus B square plus twice of this into this which will be L into B. So B square B square cancels out. We have L into B is equal to L square minus L square by 4 which is 3L square by 4. L, L gets cancelled out. So we have B is equal to 3L by 4. From here we get B by L is equal to 3 is to 4. So the ratio of shorter side B to the longer side L is 3 by 4 which is option D. Thank you. Hi. Now here in this question we have uh, the Weirdo Holiday Resort follows a particular system of holidays for its employees. People are given holidays on the days where the first letter of the day of the week is same as the first letter of their names. Cool. All employees work at the same rate. So what does that mean is, for example if someone's name starts with A, will he get a holiday? No. See, the days of the week are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So, an employee will only get a leave if the first letter of his or her name coincides with the day of the first letter of the day of the week. So, A does not, is not same as the first letter of any day of the week. So, A will, anyone whose name starts with A will not get any leave. What if you, let's say, have Tarun? Now, someone whose name is Tarun, that is the name starts with T, will get leave on Tuesdays and Thursdays. For example, Smita. Now, if you have Smita, Smita will, will get leaves on Saturdays and Sundays because her name starts with S, which is same as the first letter of Saturday and Sunday. Right? So, this is what is given. So, the first question here is, Raja starts working on February 25th so and finishes the job on March 2nd, 1996. Now, 1996 is a leap year. Remember, so we'll have a 29th February in between. So, the work starts on 25th of Feb, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th of Feb, then 1st of March and 2nd of March. So, this is Feb and this is March. So, Raja completes this work in exactly 7 days, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 days. Assuming that efficiency per person is 1 unit per day, for simplicity let's assume this. So, what happens is, what is the total work done by Raja? The total work done by Raja will be, his efficiency is 1 unit per day and he works for 7 days. So, the total work to be done is 7 units. Okay. Now, this work is being done by, so question is, how much time would T and J take to finish the same job if both start on the same day as Raja? Now, there are two people T and J, so their names start with T and J. So, J will not receive any holidays, right, because no, no day of the week starts with J, but T will receive holidays or leaves on two days, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Because Tuesday and Thursday both start with T. Now, J will work on all these days, but what about T? T will get leaves on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, do we have, when do we have Tuesdays and when do we have Thursdays over here? For that, we'll have to do some additional calculation. So, here we'll have to use the concept of calendars. So, we need to first figure out 25th of February 1996 is which day of the week. So, for that, 
uh, if you would remember the concepts of calendar we'll use those concepts here so we have to go till 25th feb 1996 so there are 1995 complete years and of the 1996th year we have complete january plus few days of february complete january is 31 days and we have to go till 25th february so 25 days of february so we have a total of uh, 356 days of 1996 and the complete 1995 years can be broken up as 1600 years plus 300 years plus the 95 years now we know the first 1600 years of the calendar have zero odd days the next 300 will have one odd day and this 95 to calculate number of odd days in 95 will have to first calculate number of leap years and non leap years to calculate number of leap years divide 95 by 4 the quotient comes out to be 23 so this is the number of leap years and the number of non leap years will be 95 minus 23 which is 72 now each leap year has two odd days and each non leap year has one odd day so we have 46 plus 72 odd days in these 95 years so 46 plus 72 is 118 odd days okay so 118 plus 1 is 119 plus 0 is 119 So the total odd days here is 119, but since this is greater than 7, we further divide it by 7, and when you further divide it by 7, the remainder will be zero. So effectively, in the first 1995 years, the number of odd days is zero, and for the 1996 year, we have 56 days. Dividing by 7 and calculating the remainder, 56 when divided by 7, the remainder is zero. So here also we have zero odd days. So total odd days. Till twenty fifth Feb nineteen ninety six is zero plus zero, which is zero, and there are zero odd days after Sunday. That means twenty fifth February of nineteen ninety six will be a Sunday itself. So now that we have figured out that twenty fifth Feb nineteen ninety six was a Sunday, now it becomes easier to figure out on which date who will be working and who will not be working out of T and J. so let's see that so 25th is a sunday this is a sunday so this will be a saturday this will be sorry monday not saturday sorry this will be a monday then we'll have a tuesday wednesday thursday friday and saturday okay so we know j will be working on all these Seven days, J J J J J J J, but T will not be working on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So T will be working on Sunday, Monday, not Tuesday, Wednesday, not Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now together, both of them need to complete seven units of the work. So let's see in how many days will seven units of the work be completed. So on the first day. both will complete one unit of the work on sunday so the total work done will be two units on monday again both of them are working so two units will be done on tuesday only j is working so one unit is done so the total work done so far is 2 plus 2 4 plus 1 5 then on uh, wednesday again both of them are working so two units is done so in these four days the total amount of work done is seven units that means the whole work will get completed in how many days does whole work get completed in four days itself so the correct answer here will be option a okay now coming to the next question now for the next question it's given that starting on 25th feb the same thing raja finishes the job on april 2 so in february he works for 25 26 27 28 29 so he works for five days in february then you have march in march he works for the full march full march is 31 days and then in april he works for 2 days so raja works for a total of 38 days at an efficiency of 1 unit per day so the total work done will be 38 units by raja raja completes 38 units okay now the question is 
when would t and s together likely to have completed the job had they started on the same day as raja now we are talking about t and s not t and j so here let's see on which day of the week will each of them will be working okay so this is sunday monday tuesday wednesday then you have thursday on 29th uh friday on 1st and uh, saturday on 2nd so this comprises of one full week right so on sunday only t will be work sorry okay so we have t and s right so t will be working on this day this day not here this day not here here and here s will not be working on saturdays and sundays but s will be working on the remaining days fine so what happens is in one complete week t works on 5 days and s also works on 5 days so the total work done work done per week by t and s together will be 5 units of the work will be done by t and 5 units of the work will be done by s so total 10 units of the work is done in one week and together they have to complete 38 units of the work So how will you complete 38 units of the work how will they complete 10 units will be done in week 1 10 units will be done in week 2 and 10 units will be done in week 3 so week 1 gets over on 2nd of march on on 2nd of march week 2 will get over 7 days after this that is on 9th of march and week 3 will get over 7 days after this that is on 16th of march okay now after 16th of march 30 units of the work is done there is still 8 units of the work left okay now 17th of march will again be a sunday so this will be 17th then you'll have 18 19 20 21 22 and 23 so let's see on which day of the week the remaining 8 units of the work will be completed So on Sunday, one unit will be completed. We have to complete eight out of which one is done. On Monday, two units are done. So total three are done. Then here also one unit is done. So total four is done. Here two units will be done. So total uh, six units is done. Here one unit will be done. Seven units, and here two units will be done, which exceeds eight. So work will not get completed on twenty first of March. It will finally get completed on twenty second of the. march so when would t and s together likely to have completed the job had they started on the same day as raja they would have completed the work on 22nd of march option c is the right answer here thank you hi Here in this question we have uh, Boston is four hours ahead of Frankfurt and two hours behind India. So we have three cities: Frankfurt, Boston, and India. Boston is four hours ahead of Frankfurt. So let's take the time at Frankfurt as the base. Boston is four hours ahead of Frankfurt. So whatever time at Frankfurt will be. Time at Boston will be four hours more than Frankfurt. Also, it's given that Boston is two hours behind India, or in other words, India is two hours ahead of Boston. That means time at India will be six hours ahead of Frankfurt. So time at India will be f plus six. Okay. Now, what happens is x leaves Frankfurt at six p.m. Now this time is the local time, based on Frankfurt. someone leaves at 6 pm on friday 6 pm on a friday and reaches boston the next day after waiting there for 2 hours he leaves exactly at noon so that means on saturday at noon 12 noon this person left but in between he waited for 2 hours here okay Now, after waiting for two hours, at twelve noon, this person leaves. X leaves from Boston and reaches India at one a.m. Okay, so if twelve noon Saturday he leaves, one a.m. will be Sunday. That's 
what we are talking about so now what is the time taken by this person to go from frankfurt to india let's see we know if the time is 6 pm at frankfurt the time at india will be 6 hours more than this so 6 hours more than this will effectively be 12 am 12 am on uh, instead of friday it will become a saturday here right so from saturday early morning 12 am till sunday early morning 1 am so what happens is mr x whoever x is travels from 12 am saturday till 1 am sunday so the amount of time uh, this person travels is effectively 25 hours right from 12 am saturday till 12 am sunday will be 24 hours plus one more hour from 12 am till 1 am so the total time this person travels is 25 hours and x travels at 180 miles per hour based on the first question so for the first question the distance between frankfurt and india is going to be time taken 25 hours into speed which is 180 miles per hour okay so this will give us the distance in miles so this is effectively 1800 by 4 which is uh, 18000 by 4 rather and this comes out to be 9000 half of 9000 4500 miles so the distance between india and frankfurt is option b 4500 miles okay now coming to the next question we have if x had started the return journey from india at 255 am okay on the same day that he reached there after how much time would he reach frankfurt okay so if he starts at 255 am on sunday on the same day he started back right so he reached on sunday so he starts back on sunday so 255 am on a sunday and since it took him 25 hours with a 2 hour break in between so to go back it will take him 1 hour less now he is taking only a 1 hour break and not 2 uh, hour break so return journey will be 1 hour less than 25 hours so the return journey will take a total of 24 hours so he or she mr x will reach at 255 am on a monday but this is the time based on india this is indian time right and we know frankfurt will be 6 hours behind india india is 6 hours ahead of frankfurt so frankfurt will be 6 hours behind india so the time at frankfurt will be okay we don't have to calculate time the uh, the question is uh, after how much time would he reach frankfurt so he will reach after option a 24 hours with a one hour break in between so the answer to this question is option a itself okay now finally in the last question we need to calculate what is x is average speed for the entire journey to and fro now this is a stand alone question right we don't we cannot use this information here so we don't know the distance between frankfurt and india now if we don't know the distance between frankfurt and india and we obviously cannot use this information as well so we can we don't know what is the total distance between frankfurt and india and what's the total time to go from frankfurt to india and then come back since we don't know both the things distance as well as time it's not possible to calculate the average speed for the entire journey so the answer to this question must be option d data is insufficient thank you hi in this question we have in the adjoining figure points a b c d lie on circle such that ad is 24 and bc is 12 what is the ratio of area of cbe this triangle to that of ade this triangle okay now consider these two triangles triangle uh, cbe and triangle ade okay now in these two triangles we know this angle is equal to this angle right angle c 
E B is equal to angle A E D vertically opposite angles, right? Also, this angle must be equal to this angle. Why? A C is a chord, and A C chord is making these two angles in the same segment. So, angles made by a chord in the same segment of the circle are equal. Angle B is equal to angle D. Now, in these two triangles, since two angles are equal, both these triangles will be similar triangles. Triangle CBE will be similar to triangle ADE by AA rule. Now, since the triangles are similar, we can say that the ratio of area, area of triangle CBE and area of triangle ADE will be square of the ratio of their sides. Now, if we consider CBE, if we consider the side CB, the corresponding side CB is opposite to this angle. So, corresponding side in the other triangle will be AD. AD. So, the ratio of area of the two triangles will be square of CB upon AD. Now, CB we know is 12 and AD is 24. So, 12 upon 24 is effectively 1 by 2. 1 by 2 whole square is 1 is to 4. So, the ratio of the area of these two triangles is option A, 1 is to 4. Thank you. Hi. In this question, we have in the given figure EADF is a rectangle. EADF is a rectangle. And triangle ABC is such that its vertices lie on the sides EADF. So, triangle ABC is also drawn. Such that these sides are 22, 6, 2, and 16. FC is 16 here. Okay. Now, we have to figure out the length of line joining the midpoints of sides A, B and B, C. So, A, B will be midpoint will be somewhere here. B, C midpoint will be somewhere here. We have to figure out the length of this side. Now, this question may look a little difficult, but it's very simple. We know in any triangle, the line joining the midpoints or the length of the line joining midpoints of two sides will be half of the third side. So, the length of this side is going to be half the length of A, C. So, what effectively we need to now calculate is the length of AC. Half of it will be the length of this side that we want. Now, to calculate uh, AC, we know it's a rectangle. So, this is a right angle triangle. ACD is a right angle triangle. Consider triangle ACD. Here, AC is the uh, hypotenuse. So, we have AC square should be equal to AD square plus CD square, right? Now, what is AD? AD is the shorter side which is equal to 6 plus 2, 8. So, AD is 8. So, we have AD square plus. What about CD? What is the length of CD? We know FD is 22 same as AE out of which FC is 16. So, this here must be 22 minus 16 which is 6. So, CD is 6. So, CD square is 6 square. So, this is 64 plus 36 which is 100. So, AC square is 100, that means AC is square root of 100, 10. So, AC is 10, hence the length of the line joining the midpoints will be 10 by 2, which is 5 units. So, the correct answer here is option B. Thank you. Hi. In this question, we have a thief after committing the burglary started fleeing at 12 noon at a speed of 60 kilometers per hour. So, this is the place, let's say, thief at 12 noon started running at a speed of 60 kilometers per hour. He was then chased by a policeman X. Now, X started the chase 15 minutes after the thief had started. So, for the first 15 minutes, only thief ran. So, the distance travelled by thief in 15 minutes, what will it be? Let's see. Speed of the thief is 60 km per hour and time here is 15 minutes and converted into hours, it's 15 by 60 hours. So, the thief will travel a total of 15 km by the time the other policeman starts. So, what will happen is thief will reach at this point which is 
15 kilometers ahead now at this point thief is running at 60 kilometers per hour and now the policeman x starts running at 65 kilometers per hour okay and what is this time this time is 15 minutes after the burglary so this is at 12:15 this is at 12:15 noon pm this is at 12:15 okay now the first question is at what time did x catch the thief so for x to catch the thief the time taken will be the distance between them which is 15 km divided by their relative speed which is 65 minus 60 so 15 by 5 is 3 hours so it will take 3 hours for the for x to catch the thief 3 hours after 2:15 so 3 hours after 2:15 is 3:15 pm so x will catch the thief at 3:15 pm okay this was the first question of the set now the second question of the set is if another policeman had started the same ch ch uh, chase along with x so there was another policeman let's say y who also starts at 12:15 along with x but his speed is 60 km per hour okay then how far behind was he when x caught the thief so what happens is now you look at the thief and you look at y both of them are traveling at the same speed so the distance between them will actually never change it will neither reduce nor increase so the distance between them will always remain 15 km right wherever they uh, as long as both are running the distance between them will remain 15 km so the question is how far behind was he this police when when x caught the thief so right when x stopped uh, or x caught the thief when the thief stopped what was the distance between them the distance between them would have been 15 kilometers only option b is the right answer thank you